Well, thank you very much, Albert, for that overwhelming um, introduction. And thank you all for, um, for coming. I'll, of course, well, not of course, but I will uh, start by apologizing a little bit. Um, the title of the talk is sort of misleading. That is, it's just the title of the larger project that we're working on right now. It was the thing that occurred to me when the title was required. Um, and so, as Helmut said, it's about the changing ways in which wildness has been understood, mostly in the Anglophone world, over the last few centuries, and specifically with relation to non-human animals. Among other things, I'm asking, what difference do these changes make to them? What difference do they make to us? So my project is related to the discussion of wilderness that has mostly been focused on the landscape at large that's been elaborated by environmental historians over the last few decades, but it's not exactly part of the middle of that discussion. And one thing, as Helmut suggested, among several things that sets this particular uh, a topic apart, is its relation to its opposite. That is to say, any attempt to uh, understand what makes an animal wild, um, in, well, from our point of view, obviously, I don't know from theirs, um, almost immediately requires a corresponding attempt to understand what would make it not wild. And perhaps the plethora of words for that category, at least in English, which includes not just domesticated, but also tame, captive, and stretching it a bit further, something like feral, uh, is an indication of the complexity or the ambiguity that's inherent in all these categories. Um, now, just because they're ambiguous doesn't mean they're not useful or widely deployed. So, for example, one famous um, example, uh, if somewhat reductive, of using this relationship um, occurs in something you're probably all familiar with, the powerful analogy with which Darwin um, introduces his theory of uh, evolution by natural selection in On the Origin of Species. That is, he knew that his readers, both lay readers and uh, expert readers, would be familiar with the practices employed by um, breeders to improve elite livestock and pets, and he therefore hoped it wouldn't be too difficult for them to imagine a situation in which human judgment had been replaced by the harsher or maybe more basic pressures that were exerted by nature. So the parallel between wild species and domesticated breeds, okay, I can press this forward but not back, uh, is far from complete, uh, however, and the combination of similarity and difference that made Darwin's juxtaposition, juxtaposition of wild and domesticated animals in this way made it both effective, it is very effective, but also somewhat mi misleading, still persists. And in fact, as human impact on the environment has become increasingly pervasive, the reciprocal resonance of these categories has intensified. The animal wild, wildness in animals, becomes more appealing as it has become less available, or maybe actually as it has become less wild. And as the valence of wildness has altered, the stakes around its definition have increased. And this has implications for enterprises as diverse as livestock breeding and environmental conservation. But I'm not going to talk about those. Um, I'm going to return now to Darwin's time and place and for a little bit shift the focus to people. Um, the closest human equivalent to domestication is probably civilization, or actually it's probably domestication, but people don't like to um, refer to themselves as domesticated animals. Um, so most 19th century Britons, uh, 19 out of 20 uh, 
to, um, according to one calculation, which is not particularly reliable, but it has numbers. Um, most of them regarded themselves as the most civilized people in the world. And in fact, other people shared that assessment, even if they didn't think it necessarily made the British all that good, even if they usually, if they used it to criticize British nat national failings. So, for example, in a treatise on social reform, an Irish uh, legislator, when he lamented, he said, civilized England has a greater percentage of her children sunk in the most degrading vice that ever afflicted mankind than any other nation under heaven, which vice was drunkenness. But most declarations of superior English civilization were more positive. Ooh, come back. For example, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, who was an enthusiastic supporter of the Crystal Palace exhibition that was held in London in 18, 1851, felt that no country was in a better position than England to host a display, which this was, of the point of development at which the whole civilized world has reached. And of course, the civilizing mission was an all-purpose inspiration or apologia for the imperial appropriation of remote territories so that their fortunate inhabitants could enjoy the same excellent advantages as did metropolitan British subjects. Now, especially with regard to remote exotic colonies, one frequently rehearsed benefit of the British Imperium was the triumph of civilization over the wildness or savagery that was considered uh, by colonial officials and, and their masters to prevail in such places. So at least from the perspective of symbolism, one of the most important duties of local officials in the British Raj, for example, in South Asia, was the protection of vulnerable villagers from dangerous wild animals, especially those that could be characterized as man killers, or even worse, or maybe even better, as man eaters. Um, and this is. Um, actually somebody in the 20th century who, after he finished killing a load of tigers, became a great um, advocate of uh, uh, animal protection and has National Park named after him in East Africa. Um, anyway, but one late Victorian 19th century district officer, someone who was stationed in an Indian forest, he boasted that he closed his courtroom immediately. He said, whenever news was brought of a tiger, panther, or bear, anywhere within 20 miles, so he closed his courtroom, grabbed his gun, and went out and shot it. Um, another one, such uh, official who'd served in Ceylon, fondly remembered, he said, the grateful people ready to bless the white man who freed them from the incursions of dangerous foes. And it may, I'm not sure exactly in what way it's related, but if you go to the BBC website now, today, you will find a, a big conspicuous link to people who have been eaten and bitten by tigers in the Sundarbans um, in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, so it continues, it continues as a theme. But anyway, in addition to their practical utility by uh, getting rid of, of uh, dangerous animals, this kind of um, activity buttressed the rhetoric of imperialism by suggesting the physical and moral superiority of uh, Europeans, as well as their readier access to guns and ammunition. The discussions of it, the discourse repeatedly suggested that natives lacked the courage to confront such predators or the intelligence to outwit them. Of course, you know, this, uh, like all such bravado, it can turn into a kind of double-edged sword. If you've read um, George Orwell's uh, essay, Shooting an Elephant, published in the 1930s, which uh, recounts an occasion where he felt compelled to shoot an elephant that really wasn't doing anyone any harm because of the pressure of a, a crowd of people in Burma, and he, he ends the essay uh, he says, I often wondered whether any of the others grasped that I have done it solely to avoid looking like a fool. Not, not that many imperialists uh, had that kind of 
uh, introspection. But anyway, this measure of civilization was also retrospectively applied to the imperial center. So one of the indices of Britain's self-assigned position at the top of what we might now call the civilization league tables, uh, ahead even of its continental European competitors, was the subdued placidity of its countryside. There had been a time when solitary laborers and travelers had been as vulnerable in Britain as they continued to be in the wilds of Asia or Africa or North America. So a late 19th century zoologist who was surveying the mammals of Britain, he reported that during the Anglo-Saxon period, wolves were so numerous and so terrible, uh, were their de devastations during the winter, that January was de designated the wolf month. But not only did the Norman conquerors defeat the English in 1066, but ultimately they triumphed in a long war of attrition against these predators, which finally all disappeared in England by the early, uh, the early Tudor period. So a Victorian naturalist called James Edmund Harding reflected in a book that was called um, the, the Extinct Animals of Britain, he said, the moors and woods and glens which we now traverse so securely were infested with ferocious animals, not just wolves but also bears and wild boars. And you can see the wild boars have come back, um, not out of the woods as they have here, but because people were breeding them uh, on, on farms and they, um, they have escaped. But Harding was at, of at least two minds about these developments. That is to say, he chose his topic with nostalgia as well as with relief. Although English life was surely easier and more efficient without these kind of animals running around, um, it also could seem somewhat diminished. So to quote him again, he said, the interest which atta attaches to the history of extinct British animals can only be equaled by the regret which must be felt by all true naturalists at their disappearance beyond recall from our fauna. Now, he may not have been expressing a majority view. Most people probably don't welcome the return of wolves and bears. But neither was he completely idiosyncratic as modern life became more secure. Um, after all, since early in the previous century, that is the 18th century, even the word savage had collocated with noble as well as with more negative terms. And during the same period, there were other more concrete indications of the rising stock of wildness. So while many rural magnates, owners of, of great estates, were devoting themselves to agricultural improvement, which intensified human control of the landscape, sometimes overtly and sometimes actually in a very elaborately veiled manner, which is also um, actually evoked in the name of the English garden here. Um, a few paradoxically prided themselves on the herds of wild cattle that roamed their estates. Um, so this is a, what, a misleadingly nuclear family. Um, <laughs> Uh, these animals, uh, which are called Chillingham cattle from, from the, um, the place they live, they allegedly descended directly from the aboriginal aurochs, and I'll come back to that, without having endured a humiliating interlude of domestication. So the most uh, celebrated herd was this one um, at Chillingham Castle in Northumberland, where they served as totems for the earls of Tankerville, and therefore as, for, among other things, symbolic meat on occasions, special occasions, such as the coming of age of an heir. And when they were eaten, uh, they were never uh, slaughtered in the ordinary way of cattle, but somebody went out and actually shot them. Um, their, their descendants still roam their ancestral park. There they are, wild, wild as ever. Um, even though the actually earls of Tankervilles have um, departed for North, North America. 
So the qualities that these allegedly wild cattle embody, strength, aggression, and independence, resonated with those embodied by some other elite mascots, most notably the lion that represented both the English monarch, the British monarch, and the nation as a whole. But a sneaking um, fondness for wildness gradually trickled down the social ladder, and you can see it in various, various different ways. For example, uh, there was a lot of um, publicity, thrill, thrilled publicity, thrilled reportage of the discovery of the Kirkdale Cave in Yorkshire, and what was found there were the remains of a load of uh, hyenas that had lived in Britain in an earlier, much earlier period, along with the bones of uh, their prey, many of which also had disappeared. So that conjured up a vision of a zoological past that was much more dramatic than a recent past that was merely populated by wolves and bears. And even further back still, there was a really unrecognizable, but also in a way appealing Britain populated by giant reptiles uh, belonging to an order that were christened Dinosauria by the, uh, the, by the naturalist Richard Owen in 1842. And they re rapidly became popular fa favorites, as of course they have um, remained. And in fact, large dinosaur models were one of the star attractions of the Crystal Palace um, when it was originally er erected in Hyde Park and then later when it moved across the river. And what this is, is a picture of um, scientists having a celebratory dinner inside one of the dinosaur models. And here they are, you can see them. Um, although I think they've been, they've been re, re, redone because they burned at one point. Um, so Charles Dickens conjured with this same fascination at the beginning of his novel Bleak House, where he described the miserable November weather in, in, um, in terms that jumbled the biblical and the paleontological. So I'll just quote one, one sentence. As much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth, and it would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus 40 feet long or so, waddling like an elephantine lizard up Hoburn Hill. And Britons were not the only people for whom wild cattle seemed like an access accessible representatives of their connection to a more heroic uh, national or ethnic past. As I said, among the many distinctions claimed for ch the Chillingham cattle, the white cattle, um, was relatively direct uh, descent, that is relative in comparison with uh, the descent of ordinary cattle from the aurochs. And so this is the skeleton of an aurochs. The, or just, uh, an aurochs. the aurochs is the ancestor of all modern domestic cattle, including the hump zebu cattle of South Asia and East Africa. None are now alive, except in, I suppose, strictly cladistic terms, the same way you would say maybe birds are dinosaurs. Um, but they haven't been extinct for long. The last one, was a female, was killed in 1627 in what is now Poland. So in addition to loads of bones, there is lots of human testimony about them, beginning with the paintings on uh, cave walls. This is an aurochs from Lascaux in France. They were hunted by um, the Romans, who made horns, hunting horns, uh, instruments, out of their horn horns. And this is not a Roman one, but allegedly, uh, it's a more recent one, allegedly made not from the last oryx that was a cow, but the last male oryx. Um, and they figured in the bestiaries compiled by the list who might actually uh, 1556. Now, despite this long coexistence and this plethora of evidence, they seem to have slipped quickly out of mind as well as out of sight. By the time that wildness was beginning to exert its distinctively modern appeal, the appeal we all still feel, the confusion that's noted in the cap caption of this image uh, had become persuasive. 
And what it says is, ignorant people call me a bison. So, um, just to make things clear, the Wiesent, or European bison, does not look much like an oryx. I mean, given that they're both bovines. But what, it, uh, so, that is a European bison. What it looks like is an American bison. This one is bigger and hairier, but basically it's the same, the same kind of idea. They're the only two extant members of the genus bison at, uh, in current taxonomy. But nevertheless, they were uh, routinely confounded, not inevitably, but routinely. So in 1847, a popular sports periodical excitedly announced that the London Zoo had received the most important addition that has ever been made to it in its 20 years that it had been operating at that, so that point, which was the aurochs, or European bison, part of the last remnant of this noble race. Um, the sight of which will carry back the classical reader to the German wars of Rome and the paleontologist to the days of the mammoth and the mastodon. Of course, the sports pages don't, don't sound like that uh, anymore. But, and this kind of confusion was actually exacerbated also by scientists. Um, several de de uh, w. Boyd Daw Dawkins, who was a distinguished paleontologist, he was the professor of geology at Owens College, which was the predecessor of the University of Manchester. He focused on relatively arcane nomenclatural ambiguities addressing the ge geological society. So he said, but he came to the same conclusion. He said the synonymy of the Bos Urus is in a state of very great confusion arising from the fact that the two words denoting two distinct species, the Urox and the Aurox, are derived from the same Sanskrit root. But despite this learned preamble, he asserted that the term Aurox has been re restricted to the European bison by the authority of Buffon, Cuvier, and Professor Owen. The term Urox, or Bos Urus, to the species under consideration by Julius Caesar, Pliny, and other writers of the 6th to the 12th century. But not everyone was confused, whatever their level of expertise. So um, a periodical called The Ladies' Newspaper easily made the distinction that's now recognized by current consensus, noting that not many years back, two specimens of the European bison were under the rather, rather puzzling name of aurochs exhibited in the zoological uh, society. But interestingly, the connotation of this label remained the same, even though its denotation could vary. That is, the animal in question, whichever animal it was, was always noble and rare, imposing and threatened, associated with royalty often. So the fact that the significance of the aurochs remained constant, whether it was an extinct cow or a living bison, strongly su uh, suggests that a large component of its appeal was in fact uh, symbolic or metaphoric. It was a representative, whether already extinct or on the verge of disappearing, of a wilder, stronger, nobler, and purer Europe. And the importance of this set of associations is also suggested by the Oryx's most more recent fans. By the end of the 19th century, most clear that the wild oryx was extinct and that however engaging bison or weasants might be, they were something different. But that didn't mean that everyone was happy about this situation, that is to say uh, extinction. And somewhat paradoxically, the refinements in the theory and practice of domestic animal breeding that had been developed in the 18th and 19th centuries have inspired a series of attempts to resurrect the aurochs. So in the 1920s and 30s, a couple of German brothers, uh, Heinz and Lutz Heck, uh, uh, attempted to recreate the aurochs by the, a technique called breeding back from various uh, European cattle breeds um, that in their view had retained char characteristics that were um, primitive. 
They proceeded independently. That is, one brother was based here in Munich, one was based in Berlin. Um, they actually had different originating ideas of what an aurochs orac should look like. They chose different breeds as the basis of their uh, reconstruction, and they also nurtured them in somewhat different settings. Zoo here, uh, more expansive uh, fields or pastures in Berlin. But nevertheless, they both succeeded in producing uh, an aurochs, and they um, both agreed that each other had done it. Um, now, other observers have been more critical. Um, some of this criticism was practical, since the brothers, both of them, concentrated on superficial characteristics like horn shape and coloration and so forth. Um, and also, neither one of them actually kept very good records of the cattle they started with or, or what their, um, uh, their, their pedigrees had, had been. Um, a comparison of uh, someone's idea of what a, an actual aurochs would have been like and what the uh, heck cattle um, were like. So obviously one thing, they're not as big. Um, and some of the criticism was political. Since both brothers were associated um, to different extents with the National Socialist regime, and since the symbolism surrounding this allegedly primordial European animal was readily incorporated into a certain strain of Nazi thought. But although the reputation of the Heck brothers diminished greatly after the Second World War, their cattle have continued to enjoy a kind of niche es esteem um, herds are scattered across Europe, mostly, I think, just because people like them. You can see they're very fetching. Um, but also, in um, some places like, I'm, I'm not going to do a good job with this, uh, Uswarderplassen in the Netherlands, um, where there's an attempt to recreate a pre-agricultural European land, uh, landscape. And sometimes the various associations that the breed has accumulated uh, over, over time are combined, jumbled, uh, as in the somewhat mischievous headline of an article that was published in 2009 by the Times, the English uh, uh, Times, um, and this, the headline says, A Shaggy Cow Story, How a Nazi Experiment Brought to Devon. And discrediting the Heck brothers hasn't meant the end of efforts to bring back the Aurochs, inspired actually by rather similar understandings and values. According to the Taurus Foundation, the Aurochs has always been at the very root of the whole idea of a continent called Europe. It is in fact our continent's defining animal. Uh, so starting in 2008, the foundation has been using uh, re modern technologies to develop a breed called the Tauros, so spelled like tar Taurus, but with an O. And there he is. Um, and that's being introduced in various rewilding locations around um, Europe, although it's also still in process of being refined and improved. The claim that it re replicate the claim is that it replicates um, all the benefits of the aurochs with regard to uh, landscape maintenance and um, providing um, a, a basis for a lot of uh, bi uh, biodiversity, while eliminating some of the drawbacks of the aurochs, such as its extreme ferocity. Although, actually, some of the advocates of the aurochs or the new aurochs sometimes suggest that the aurochs, the old aurochs, was probably nicer than people like Julius Caesar uh, claimed. But anyway, this makes the Taurus breeders sound a lot like the 18th and 19th century English magnates who like to think of their, that their unruly cattle were actually wild beasts. So, to return to where I started, why did a nation that regarded itself as the epitome of civilization ascribe an increasingly positive valence to wildness? 
may simply be the uh, inherent heterogeneity that, say, C.S. Lewis uh, identified in his novel that hideous strength, when he, which is not about cows, when he described England as simultaneously a, a nation of shopkeepers and a nation of poets. And he pointed out that similar paradoxes exist with regard to other nations, which also suggest another kind of question. So why was a quality like wildness perceived, whether accurately or not, as characteristic or desirably characteristic in any case of Britain, when it was also at least equally characteristic of many other places? And many similar questions actually frequently come up with regard to national symbols drawn from nature, since the environment is not ordinarily constrained by human boundaries, except to the extent, um, you know, often a large extent, that the environment has been shaped by human activity. And so, just to give a different 19th century um, example, one that Helmut uh, referred to, uh, in the 19th century, the architecture of Gothic cathedrals, which John Ruskin, uh, most famously but not originally, understood as evoking the arched canopy of forest trees, was claimed by most of the nations in which it occurred as a foundational national style. So that's the cathedral in, um, in the north of England. And this is the reason that the Houses of Parliament were rebuilt in that style, at least that was, as, as it was understood in the 1830s after it was destroyed by fire. That is, it, the alternative would have been a classical, a classical style. And so a style that originally expressed the cultural unity of Catholic Europe was repurposed to represent emerging national differentiation. So it's possible that like the idea of wildness, the de desire to differentiate um, the point was more important than the means that were employed to embody it. <laughs>